Okay, so here we are. We are at the end of unit eight. So this is the chapter where we're gonna to put together all of those parts to the Vietnam War. So we're gonna look at the protest movements. We'll look at the, the music. We'll also look at some of the other domestic issues starting with um, Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, start with the Great Society and then we'll also bring in all of Vietnam. So let's go ahead and get started as we are finishing up with unit eight. So um, look at the dates here again, 1961. So we're gonna kind of go back to um, just after Kennedy was elected and, and bring everything forward. And we'll get to 1972 and look a little bit at um, Nixon's first term uh, in office. So we will, and, and look more or less at his foreign policy. Okay, so with the legislation that's been passed, starting with Kennedy and then moving through Lyndon Johnson, we're going to see a huge shift in domestic programs and policies that are passed by the legislature. And that's gonna be this liberal agenda. Certainly the Civil Rights Act uh, of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, the uh, poll tax being abolished with the amendment, 24th amendment. We're going to have some policies related to women's rights that will be passed. Title IX will be added in. We're going to see other um, programs for um, Medicare and Medicaid, which would be insurance for the elderly and the poor. All of this is part of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, his liberal agenda. Not everybody was on board with this. There were people who, again, were looking at all of the costs that were going into the Cold War and the weapon development at that time. You had people who believed that this was just way too much government involvement in business and in society. You know, we talked a little bit about during the New Deal, this idea of the welfare state. Many people look at Lyndon Johnson's programs which we're gonna to bring together and, and refer to them collectively as the Great Society. They make a lot of comparisons between the Great Society and Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal about this idea of liberal government involvement in programs, the welfare state uh, and all of that and how those are, are similar and different. So I would kind of file that away to be making some comparisons there between the Great Society and the New Deal. Okay, so when we are referring to Lyndon Johnson's programs, absolutely you need to know that they are collectively referred to as the Great Society. And he had come to power after Kennedy's assassination. And look at his approach. He gave this speech where he, he kind of frames it all and, and gives it that name, the Great Society, that abundance and liberty for all, an end to poverty and racial injustice. So he's gonna have what he calls a war on poverty uh, you'll remember when we talked about the Kerner Commission report where there were riots in urban areas in the uh, mid 1960s and they investigated what's the root cause? Why are urban areas being burnt down and looted and, and what's causing all of this violence? And obviously the finding was poverty, systemic poverty and racism that were um, uh, common in urban areas. And he's going to, to take on this as a, a priority in his administration. So let's back up a little bit and look at Kennedy's legislative record. Now we talked a lot about his foreign policy in the previous chapter where we discussed the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Bay of Pigs and his efforts with the Cold War um, and this rivalry with Nikita Khrushchev. But look at his domestic policy within the United States. What is he promoting? We know that he promoted that Civil Rights Act um, and the, the rallies that were related to that with the March on Washington in 1963. But he's also talking about activism for all Americans. Look at this statement. This is from one of his inaugural, his inaugural address where he said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. So he's saying, yes, we've got this, this new liberal approach where the government and the government programs coming out of the New Deal are, are kind of more commonplace now, but Americans have to also give back uh, to their country and volunteer and become part of some of these other approaches that will, uh, you know, we talked about the Peace Corps and some of those other efforts around the world. 
Kennedy, um, his administration was cut short. November of 1963, he and Jackie Kennedy were actually in Dallas, Texas. And this would have been almost a year prior to the election in 1964. He would have been up for re-election the following year. And this was kind of kickstarting and jumpstarting his campaign for re-election was to start here in, in Texas, because you'll remember he's introduced this civil rights legislation and they're worried about losing those Southern votes. So he starts this effort to get reelected uh, in Texas. It was also noteworthy and there was a lot more media attention on his visit to Dallas because Jackie was with him. You know, the president goes and visits places all the time and there may be media attention, but you don't necessarily see huge crowds of people on the side of the road in every city that the president goes and visits. This visit was somewhat different and it was largely because Jackie was with him. She had um, just had a baby um, a little bit earlier in 1963 and his name was Patrick and he died within a, a couple of days of being born. And it was obviously devastating in a very, very private situation for um, President Kennedy and Jackie Kennedy, but yet they're in the spotlight with everything they do. So this was the first public appearance that she had made since losing the baby. So a lot of the, the public um, you know, outpouring in Dallas and the media coverage, it was largely because she was there. Now, I'm not saying that um, he alone would not have gathered a lot of attention. He would have, because again, this was about launching his re-election re campaign, but having her there with those circumstances around the baby were also very important. So this is one of the, the last images that we have of Kennedy before he was shot. So it was a beautiful day in the fall. You know, sometimes in November when you've got, you know, it's not cold and it's not hot outside and it's just this beautiful fall day. That's what it was here in, um, in Dallas on November the 22nd. And this is the governor of Texas right here. This is Governor Connolly and his wife. And they're all riding together in the motorcade and they put the top down and they're driving down this main street in Dallas uh, when he gets shot. And so we'll talk more about the, the shooting here in just a second. Um, I wanna show you this clip. This is the, um, uh, a CBS story about the assassination on one of the anniversaries. So I wanna show you this short clip. Actually, let me make sure that I shared this the right way so that you can hear the audio. Okay, now we should be able to hear the audio. We turn our attention now to history. November 22nd marches, marks 50 years since the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. In its October issue, Esquire magazine looks at the flight from Dallas back to Washington with Lyndon Johnson and Jackie Kennedy aboard. In a moment, we'll talk with author Chris Jones, but first, a look back at the day that changed the nation. It was 12.30 p.m. Central Time, a Friday, November 22, 1963. Excited spectators lined the streets of downtown Dallas, hoping to catch a glimpse of the young president and his glamorous wife. But seconds before their limousine would slip under the safety of a railroad overpass, gunshots erupted. There has been an attempt, as perhaps you know now, on the life of President Kennedy. Walter Cronkite of CBS News broke the news to the country moments after Kennedy's limo arrived at Parkland Hospital. President Kennedy has been given a blood transfusion at Parkland Hospital here in Dallas. As doctors worked frantically to save him, a crowd quickly gathered outside, anxiously waiting for any news. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. And there was a great deal of disbelief at first that the president had even been shot, and even more disbelief that he was dead. 1.26 p.m., Vice President Lyndon Johnson left the hospital for Air Force One, soon to be sworn in as the 36th president. 20 minutes later, police arrested alleged gunman Lee Harvey Oswald following a brief struggle. 2.08 p.m., a white hearse carrying the president's coffin was escorted 
to Love Field. This is John F. Kennedy, left the hospital at approximately the same time the coffin carrying the body of her husband left. At 2.20 p.m., the long journey home was about to begin. All right. We turn our attention now to. Okay, so he was shot about twelve thirty, and goes to the hospital, passes away. Um, they are preparing his body to bring him back to Washington D.C. And all of that, by the time they get back on Air Force One, and they take off from Love Field, which is the airport in Dallas, to head back to Washington. There's only about two hours that uh, of time that span there. So later on, when there's going to be a, a, a thorough investigation of what happened in the Kennedy assassination, you know, there's there's a lot of um, of of problems with the way that you know there was not a a true autopsy that was done, ballistics to understand the angles of the the wounds and all of those kinds of things. So that was that was somewhat of an issue. Um, but they needed to, as quickly as possible, get Lyndon Johnson sworn in because you need to think about the context of the time period. It is 1963. You've got the Cuban Missile Crisis that had taken place uh, a year and a half or so earlier. You've got issues in Vietnam that we're going to get into in just a few minutes. You have um, the Cold War that is raging. You've got issues with the civil rights bill that has caused controversy across the country. And it was essential at this time to get Lyndon Johnson inaugurated as quickly as possible because we might be vulnerable to attack. And, and nobody knew but what the US was under attack. We didn't know that this was domestic terrorism. We didn't know that this wasn't someone from the outside. So the image on the left here, this is on board the plane when Lyndon Johnson is being sworn in. And here he is, and then this is his wife. Um, her name was Lady Bird Johnson, that was her nickname. Um, and then there's Jackie, and just look how stunned she is, um, you know, that all of this has just happened within a couple of hours, and now her husband is gone. Um, she had just lost the baby a few months earlier. You can imagine what she was, was going through there. And she's still wearing that pink suit. Um, when they arrived back at Washington, this is JFK's brother, Robert Kennedy, who had been the attorney general for JFK in the administration. So he worked very closely with his brother. Um, he met Air Force One at the airport, and here they are. They are uh, loading the coffin off of the plane uh, and into the hearse. You can still see the blood stains on her skirt. You know, a lot of people were saying, Mrs. Kennedy, you know, we can get you clothes. Don't you want to change clothes? And she said, no, I want them to see what they've done to my husband. And so she was very aware that every move that she made was going to be um, followed very, very closely. So this is um, a few days later at the funeral. And you can see here the, um, the children, the remaining children. So this is Caroline Kennedy. Um, and then this is John Jr., John Kennedy Jr. So when we look at this photograph, we've got um, a lot of very prominent people who were very politically active. We've already said that Robert Kennedy, here he is, uh, the brother of JFK, who was the attorney general. And this is Ted Kennedy, and he was another brother of JFK. And he was um, a Massachusetts, he was in the legislature, um, um, in Congress, and then also will be a senator as well. So of all of these people, the only one who is still alive today is Caroline. And um, so they, there's just so much tragedy connected to this family. Uh, later on, Robert Kennedy in 1968 is going to run for president himself. He's going to be assassinated. We'll get to that in, in a few minutes. So he gets assassinated by a uh, Palestinian who is angry over the Kennedy brothers handling of relations in the Middle East. Um, so he does not live to serve in office. You have John Jr. who later on, once he becomes an adult, he is um, he's also uh, 
going to, to start to kind of weigh into politics a little bit in the, the late 80s. He is going to speak at one of the Democratic National Conventions. Um, and, and a lot of people think that he's on his way to becoming a politician as well, like his father and his uncles. Um, at the time, he had a magazine that he had just started. It was called George Magazine. And it was pretty famous uh, in the 80s. And um, then he married a model and her name was Carolyn Bissett. And they were actually headed to, their wedding of, was actually here in Georgia. If you've ever been to Cumberland Island in uh, off the coast of Georgia, it's kind of south of St. Simons between St. Simons and Jacksonville. It's where they have the, the wild horses on the island and there's no development and all of that. The um, John Kennedy Jr., that's where his, his wedding was. Um, so they had been married a few years and they were going to go with her sister to a, um, another wedding, a, a friend, mutual friend's wedding. And John Jr. had his pilot's license. And so he was going to fly um, he and his wife and then his wife's sister to this wedding. And they took off, I believe it was on a Sunday morning if I remember correctly. And it was really foggy. Um, off the, the coast of, of Massachusetts, where they were taking off from. And it, as best the uh, NTSB can tell, he got disoriented in the, in the fog and the plane crashed into the Atlantic Ocean and all of them died. So that, uh, you know, just more, more tragedy. Um, Ted Kennedy, who some people thought after Robert Kennedy had died, some people thought that Ted Kennedy would be the next one to run for president in the, in the Kennedy group. Um, he ended up in his own situation where there was a, um, a, a party that political uh, campaigners, people who had helped him on his campaign uh, in, the, in the Senate, the Massachusetts um, State Senate uh, election had been part of, and there was a young woman who was in his car after this party, and um, his car ran off of the road, and it was right before there was a bridge um, over the Chappaquiddick River, and the car went into the river, and the young girl who was with him, she drowned, and he didn't call the police until like the next day. And so there was a lot of um, speculation about what was going on there. Had he been drunk while he was driving? You know, there was never really a, a clear resolution to that whole situation. And so that, um, that largely prevented him from, from becoming president one day. So here is Caroline. She is the, the last of this whole Kennedy group. Um, Jackie Kennedy, was asked, especially after Robert Kennedy was assassinated, she was convinced that there were people plotting to kill all of the Kennedys. And she was, she just wanted out of the situation. Um, and she wanted to go and protect her children who were still young at that time. So she left the United States and with her kids and she went to live um, in Greece on this uh, Greek island. And she ends up marrying this um, gazillionaire from Greece. His name was Aristotle Onassis. He was in the shipping industry and he had a, a massive fortune. So she married Aristotle Onassis later on. Uh, and then the kids came back to the United States and went to college and that kind of thing. So she, she really did stay out of the, the public eye for many, many years. And after Aristotle Onassis died, she did move back to New York, but she never really was um, um, a public figure after that. She was very, very private in her life. She eventually passed away um, actually before JFK Jr. did. And then um, Ted Kennedy died probably six, eight years ago, maybe. I believe he had um, some form of cancer. Um, but at any event, that's kind of the, the background, the story of all of these, uh, the Kennedys, who were very politically connected. You know, um, the brothers, their father had been the ambassador representing the United States in England. Uh, their grandfather had been in Massachusetts politics, state politics for a long time. So this is a very, very powerful family um, that a, a lot happens to them over time. 
All right, so back to the assassination of JFK. Here is the situation. The motorcade was coming down Houston Street and then it was turning down here on Elm. And when the car comes down Elm, that's when Kennedy is shot here on, on uh, Elm Street. And this is the assassin. His name is Lee Harvey Oswald. And he was shooting from here, the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository. This building, the best I can explain it, um, if you'll remember when we had normal school and you got books um, your freshman year at, at Lassiter, you went down to the cage and that was kind of down by the gym and it's this um, stock room and it's just got shelves and shelves of all kinds of textbooks. Well, this Texas School Book Depository was basically a warehouse facility that housed textbooks for the state of, of Texas that would then be distributed to the various um, parts of, of school districts, et cetera. So Lee Harvey Oswald, um, he shot from this window. Um, there were people lining all parts of, of the, the highway. Now, the best film of what happened to try to determine angles with the reaction of Kennedy comes from a spectator and his name was John Zapruder. And he was here kind of on this hill and it's kind of this, they call it the grassy knoll. And Zapruder was there and he had his, his handheld movie camera and was you know, filming um, the president as he was, his motorcade was coming by. So that film was, was used a lot in the um, investigation to determine was Lee Harvey Oswald alone or was there a second shooter? Number of people believe that there was a second shooter over in this direction. Um, based on the recoil of Kennedy's body. But there was uh, an investigation and it was called the, um, the Warren Report, the Warren Commission Report that was set up to investigate the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And the Warren Commission Report concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald did indeed act alone. So Kennedy was killed on November the 22nd and they capture Lee Harvey Oswald. He was hiding out in a movie theater. They capture him and they arrest him and he is in the Dallas police station. Um, and they don't believe that he's terribly safe there. So they're gonna be moving him to a more secure facility. So they are in the basement of the, the Dallas police station and they're moving him on November the 24th to a different facility and all kinds of you know, police around and media around who are covering the transfer because they wanted to get a glimpse of, of who this man was who had killed Kennedy. And out of the crowd at the police station, this man steps out, notice that he's holding a gun. This is Jack Ruby. And Jack Ruby owned a bunch of nightclubs in Dallas and he stepped out of the crowd and he shot and killed Lee Harvey Oswald right there in the police station on live TV. And everyone is stunned. Um, Jack Ruby, you know, the question some people had, well, how, how was he this close to Lee Harvey Oswald? Well, Jack Ruby owning all these nightclubs, he would hire off-duty police officers to be bouncers in his nightclub. So they all knew him and he knew all of them. Um, so it was not unusual to see him hanging around the police station. All right, so he, uh, Jack Ruby goes to jail. Then there's all kind of speculation because Lee Harvey Oswald, they've not gotten information from him. You know, did he, why did he do this? Was he, you know, part of some plot from the Soviet Union to come and kill the president? Um, what is the connection between Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby? Did Jack Ruby know something that he didn't want Lee Harvey Oswald to say? You know, there was all kinds of speculation, which led to the Warren Commission being put together to investigate the assassination. All right, so here is the um, facility today. I actually got to go there a couple of years ago. I was in Dallas for um, um, you know, a, a teacher's conference and um, we actually had an event at the Texas School Book Depository. Today, it's, a, it, it's honestly, it's bizarre. It's one of those event facilities that you can rent out to have a party, kind of strange. Um, but that's where they had this event that I went to. So this is the window that we're talking about where he shot Kennedy from, and then this is Elm Street. They've also got an X in the 
street that's painted in the street to mark that location. Um, so here is when they were going in and they were looking for evidence, they do indeed find the gun, um, the rifle that he had used in the, the warehouse and it was behind a bunch of boxes. So this is that grassy knoll that I was telling you about and Zapruder would have been standing about where I'm standing, taking that video of Kennedy. So this is from the window, the sixth floor window, and you can see this would have not been, and that was some of the, the other speculation here. When you look at Lee Harvey Oswald and his assassination of Kennedy, you have a moving car that is going down the road here away from the shooter and he is shooting from this window. And, um, you know, he had to be a pretty incredible marksman to pull this type of shot off um, from this particular location. So you can see the vantage point, this is the window that he would have shot from. Um, so again, this just kind of shows it a little bit more clearly. There's the grassy knoll. Um, and then you can see the, the tunnel that they were talking about in the video that they were almost to. So this is the spot you've got the, they've kind of simulated where the boxes would have been that Oswald was, would have been hiding behind those boxes. All right, so then that just puts all of that together. So now Lyndon Johnson is president and he has a lot more legislative experience than John Kennedy had. And he uses what we call the treatment. So notice all these pictures that I have. Lyndon Johnson had a way of just trying to, to force people to do what he wanted them to do. Um, the bottom right hand picture is when he is arguing with Richard Russell, that was the Senator from Georgia who had written the Southern Manifesto, they're arguing over passage of the Civil Rights Act there. And, you know, he, he gets in people's personal space. You can just see how he is always doing that. And it makes people uncomfortable. And it was one of the strategies that he uses um, to get what he wants and to press his point. So he has a lot of experience in the, the legislative branch and he does get those great society programs move forward. So he will finish out the remaining year of Kennedy's term. So remember, there was one year left until the election. So he'll have the Civil Rights Act of 64 that gets passed before the election, and he will start on this effort, this war on poverty. Um, so notice the, um, the provisions here in his statement. He says, this administration here and now declares an unconditional war on poverty. And so when we're looking at his um, his program for economics to, to uplift people who are struggling financially. You've got three different programs that come together and are funded under this one law. The Economic Opportunity Act is going to include Head Start, Job Corps, and VISTA. So those three programs are all funded by one law. The Head Start program is very similar to what we have here in Georgia today with Head Start, I mean, um, Pre-K where you go to school before kindergarten. Um, and at this time, kindergarten, you know, the, the first time that you actually had to go to school in the 1960s and 1970s was first grade. Kindergarten was kind of um, optional and it certainly was not part of public school. It was not funded by the state and kindergarten, your parents would have had to pay for you to go. So what, um, what you know the the researchers found was that if you went to first grade and you had already been to kindergarten that your parents could afford to send you to kindergarten then you probably already knew your alphabet you probably already knew how to do some basic adding and subtracting maybe you might be able to write your name you may be able able to read a little bit other kids who had not gone to kindergarten they're showing up at first grade and they're already behind. Can you imagine going to school in the first grade and already being behind? So is school fun for you? Of course not. And so if school is not fun and you don't like school in the first grade, you're probably not gonna like it in the fourth grade or the sixth grade or the eighth grade or the 10th grade. So Head Start was a, a program by the federal government where people who were of a lower income would be provided with pre-kindergarten or pre-first grade schooling, right? And it was called the Head Start program. And so it was basically a kindergarten 
that was paid for by the government so that everybody shows up to first grade on a level playing field. Because again, if you're behind in the first grade and school is difficult and you never catch up and school is hard, then you're more likely to drop out of school and maybe not even graduate from high school and certainly not go on to college. And so this war on poverty, they're starting with the root cause and it's education, giving everyone a fair opportunity, right? Economic Opportunity Act, give everybody an equal opportunity for a quality education to you know, work hard and be able to, to gain a good job and, and be employed in a way that's going to provide you with a little bit more money. So Head Start was part of that, okay? The other um, part of this is the Job Corps, which is sort of like the Peace Corps, but it's going to be the Job Corps where there is going to be job training. So if you need to get a better job, then you need to get some skills to do that. And so the government's gonna pay through for that through this Job Corps program. And then VISTA is going to go into urban areas and begin to, it's like Peace Corps, but it's in urban centers in the United States. So this is a very, very focused effort on poverty in the United States. And it largely comes as a result of that Kerner Commission report. All right, so I, um, Ken, uh, Lyndon Johnson is elected here in 1964, but I want you to look at the outcome of the vote. So Lyndon Johnson is, um, he had finished out the remaining year of Kennedy's term. Now he's running for his term of his own. And he's up against Barry Goldwater, who is a very, very strong conservative. Um, so Barry Goldwater is from Arizona. So when we look at this election map, he wins his home state, but this Republican carries the deep South. And so this is the first election map where we've seen the solid South that had been solidly democratic ever since reconstruction is now flipped Republican, okay? So Barry Goldwater, um, again, you know, you ask, well, what about the Dixiecrats? Well, if you've got Barry Goldwater who is incredibly conservative, why would you have a third party candidate that's gonna split those votes? Because we know what happens when you split those votes. So the Republican Barry Goldwater carries the deep South, but Lyndon Johnson wins overwhelmingly in 1964. Um, so he also will get a majority Democratic House and Senate, which means that that Great Society program that we talked about, it's gonna be passed one after the other. Isn't that sort of what happened when Franklin Roosevelt came in with the New Deal, that he had a Democratic House and Senate and they passed all of this legislation. So notice what um, he's going to pass here. We've got Medicare and Medicaid, that's gonna be the insurance for the elderly and um, people of low income. So where you've got social security is providing a pension, this is providing health insurance for the elderly and people living in poverty. Environmental reform that's gonna be looking at endangered species, it's gonna start to uh, consider clean water and those kinds of issues. Notice the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Again, this is going to come out of this effort to try to shore up American schools. And um, one of the, the parts that comes out of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, if you've ever, my guess is somewhere along the way, you have watched Sesame Street. And when um, Sesame Street's on, they'll, they'll say brought to you by the Children's Television Network or you know, brought to you by the letter B and the Children's Television Network. Children's Television Network was funded by the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So if TV is so incredibly popular in the 1950s and you've got 80 to 90% of the households in the United States have a TV, and if you've got problems with, with little children coming to elementary school and they're behind because their parents are working and, and you know, uh, one of the, the great predictors here, you know, let's say if you've got the, both parents are, are off working and, um, you know, the child is, is not being read to. The child may not, the parents may not be able to afford educational toys. You know, think about when, when you were a little kid, you may have had a toy like, Le my niece has had a leapfrog, which was one of those little, not really a computer game, but you know what I'm talking about. It was a little handheld thing and it had 
um, activities where you learned colors and shapes and numbers and letters and all that stuff. Well, what if you did that on TV? And so that was part of this elementary and secondary education act. Part of this idea of the war on poverty is providing education to children who may just be sitting in front of a TV all day. Um, and then we've also got the Immigration Act of 1965. I want you to really put a star and emphasize this. When we looked at the 1920s coming out of the first Red Scare, we know that in the 1920s, one of the, one of the policies was to put a quota, the Emergency Quota Act and the National Origins Act. It put limitations on the numbers of immigrants who could come into the United States from various countries. And that had been the, the system um, from the 1920s all the way to 1965. And with the Immigration Act of 1965, it will open up immigration again. Instead of it being a quota from certain countries, there's going to be a national limit, which is going to be raised of immigrants who are allowed into the United States. It will also have a provision that will allow family members, close family members of people who are already in the United States to gain access as well. So that's going to um, open up immigration much more so than we had seen in decades and decades and decades since the 1920s. All of this is part of the Great Society. Now look at this cartoon. This is one that's been used a lot. And um, you've got the Congress there. And the Congress is being played by Lyndon Johnson, right? Because remember, he has ties to the legislature and he knows how to work a deal. He knows how to orchestrate all of this. And look at the music that's coming out. Um, Anti-poverty legislation, so that'd be the war on poverty. Everything that we've got here with the Great Society. We've got the civil rights bill. We've got defense appropriations, because again, remember we're right in the middle of the Cold War. So we're gonna have to pay for all of this the military industrial complex, all of that's coming together and being paid for. Um, and then the Southeast Asia resolution, that's talking about Vietnam. Is that also, again, you've got all of this that's happening at, at one time. Um, and, and it's difficult, but Lyndon Johnson gets it through the Congress. Okay, there are other uh, liberal movements that are going to be gaining attention. In the 60s, um, women, women's rights are one of those. So women in the workplace, there's more women that work outside the home than ever before. And they're not being paid the same wage for the same job. So these labor feminists begin this movement. Out of this, we're going to see another um, important leader emerge in that effort. And her name is Betty Friedan. And Betty Friedan is gonna do two things that you absolutely need to know. Betty Friedan, so she's in the 1960s women's movement. She's not part of um, the women's movement from the, the progressive era with the um, NAWSA and the uh, National Women's Party. This is the next generation. Um, so Betty Friedan is going to write a book and it's called The Feminine Mystique. And in her book, she's talking about um, goals that women have. She talks about the expectations, you know, why should women be treated differently? And it becomes a bestseller. And the, uh, the feminine mystique draws more uh, modern women, more young women, women who are more educated than ever before, because more women are going to college now. And they're going to be drawn to this idea of equality. And she also will help to form the National Organization for Women, or NOW. And the idea behind now was to use the court system, sort of like the NAACP did for African-Americans. Now is going to be kind of um, starting this approach in the same way to try to uh, get past that equal rights amendment that Alice Paul had first introduced in the 20s. Um, they're gonna pick that up again and try to, to work that equal rights amendment through the legislature and to add it to the constitution that would give women uh, gender equality. Um, so that's starting to kick up as well. All right, so now we want to start looking at Vietnam. So this is the second section of chapter 27 
but I had told you at the beginning of this unit to save everything about Vietnam because we're gonna put it all together right here. So some of this early information will be taken from chapter 24 because I think it fits better to tell the story all at one time. The Vietnam War will span five different presidents, six if you actually get into the fall of Saigon uh, under Gerald Ford. Um, but five presidents will be involved in America pol American policy making in Vietnam, beginning with Harry Truman. So this is part of the, um, the efforts with CETO. You'll remember Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Um, we had gotten involved in the Korean War under Truman and we had joined CETO. The Vietnam War is part of that conflict in Southeast Asia um, that we will be looking at. And then Eisenhower, Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and then Richard Nixon. So we've got to go back and start with how does this conflict develop? Well, in the age of imperialism, where you saw the scramble for Africa and you saw the spheres of influence in China, there were other areas of Asia that were also acquired by European countries and taken as colonies. Indochina was one of those places that was um, taken as a colony by France. So by Indochina, um, we are talking about these countries right here. Myanmar, which used to be called Burma, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, and Malaysia. So these countries are what we call Indochina. So it's kind of like this, this area uh, in the Asian continent between the South China Sea uh, and the Bay of Bengal with India. So this is all French territory. But when World War II is over, you'll remember that one of the, the aspects of ending World War II is decolonization. So Ho Chi Minh had become a, a pretty powerful man in Vietnam and he wanted independence from France. He wants his country of Vietnam to be an independent nation. And Ho Chi Minh had been educated in Europe. Um, he had come back to his home in Vietnam and he becomes a very, very important revolutionary leader for independence from France. So that erupts in a war between France and Vietnam. So this is again, post-World War II. So France is recovering from um, the occupation of Germany during World War II. Vietnam is now in a revolution for independence from France. And the United States has a decision to make because we have a stated goal, right? The, the four freedoms and all of that that had been set out by Franklin Roosevelt at the outset of US entry into World War II that we support decolonization. So in that respect, we would certainly side with Ho Chi Minh. But here's the problem, Ho Chi Minh is aligned with communism. So if, if Vietnam wins its independence from France, then Vietnam is going to become a, co a communist nation. And it will probably mean that Laos and Cambodia will as well. And so then all, what about all of Indochina, right? So we've got a problem because France is an ally of the United States in the Cold War but we don't support colonization. So we've got a huge decision to make here and it falls to Harry Truman. So Harry Truman's decision in all of this is to weigh all of this and his Cold War idea of the Truman Doctrine and containment, right? Stop the spread of communism anywhere in the world. That's gonna win out over decolonization. So Truman, his role in the Vietnam War is to send financial resources to help France maintain control of Vietnam. We do not send soldiers, we send money. So Truman, this is again, this is part of, you know, we looked at the money that went to Greece and Turkey to stop them from falling to communism. We saw the Marshall Plan money. This is kind of along those same lines that we are sending money to France to help them maintain control of Vietnam. All right. Ho Chi Minh has his own group of fighters, because again, he's fighting this revolution for independence. And their official name is the League for the Independence of Vietnam. And their nickname is going to be called the Viet Minh. So I always remember this now when um, in class, 
we're going to be creating a color coded map that will help you keep all of this straight. But for now, Ho Chi Minh's fighters are known as the Viet Minh. So I remember that Ho Chi's men are the Viet Minh. And they are fighting against France for independence. Where do you think Ho Chi Minh is getting this kind of equipment? Well, he's getting it indirectly from the Soviet Union. And we're helping France fight against the Viet Minh. And we're supplying them with money and supplies and weapons. So wouldn't this be an example of that indirect conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States that we call the Cold War? Absolutely. All right. Eisenhower comes in. And you'll remember that Eisenhower is a Republican. Truman was a Democrat. So he inherits this situation and he has a decision to make as well. Does he continue to financially support France in their effort to hang on to Vietnam and prevent it from falling to communism? Eisenhower agrees. And so Eisenhower does continue French support, financial support. So their, their approach to this really is not terribly different. They're both looking at it as stopping the spread of communism or containment. Um, we could also, there, there becomes a, a term that's used during this time about uh, the domino theory, because you'll remember that China, with the Chinese Civil War, Chiang Kai-shek um, or Jiang Jeshi, same guy, he had lost the revolution in China to Mao Zedong. It's now a Chinese, I mean, a, a communist nation. Korea, we've got the ceasefire, but again, did we stop this? Did we unify Korea into a non-communist nation? No. Um, if Vietnam falls to communism, then certainly Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and Malaysia fall. Then what about Indonesia? Then does it spread over into the subcontinent with India? So this domino theory, if one falls, we've got to stop this at some point. And so Eisenhower takes up that support for the French. All right, by 1954, you've got the French who will lose their war with Ho Chi Minh. And they lose at a very decisive battle called the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Now, every year I have kids who tell me that Dien Bien Phu is a person, it's not, it's a place. And this is the battle that France loses and, um, and they are going to have to surrender or call a ceasefire and end to the war. And they're gonna negotiate a settlement that ends the war. All right, so when France loses and they're going to negotiate an end to the fight, the United States is going to be part of this negotiation. All right, and the negotiation will be the Geneva Accords. So the Geneva Accords will be the negotiated settlement between France and Vietnam. And the US is involved in this kind of as that, you know, that international leader uh, in, the, in, the war, um, in the conflict at this point. So as part of this provision, what's going to happen, um, it's really, you know, up to France what they're going to agree to, but what they end up deciding is that they're going to give independence to Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. But because of this whole fear of the spread of communism, they're going to delay that decision for two years. And in 1956, they will hold elections and allow the people of Vietnam to vote and decide themselves whether or not to adopt communism as their formal um, system. All right, until then, they're going to divide Vietnam right here at the 17th line of latitude. North of that line is going to be under communist control by Ho Chi Minh. South of that line is going to be a free and democratic South Vietnam that is going to be supported and controlled by a guy named No Den Jim. He is being propped up and supported indirectly by the United States. All right, so again, let me, let me paint this picture. The Geneva Accords end the war in Vietnam between France and Vietnam, France and Ho Chi Minh. This is the provision. We're going to divide Vietnam. Isn't that kind of similar to what happened in Korea? Similar situation. Um, but here, they've got an end to it. They are planning out in the Geneva Accord that there will be a unification election, as they called it, in 1956. So this is the man that 
the United States supported. Okay, so now Kennedy is still president when all this goes down, right? So look at the, the timing. This is 1954 into 1956 is when this is gonna happen. So Eisenhower's president, Kennedy's going to come in uh, as well um, during the time that no Den Jim is there. So initially he is supported by the United States. He had been educated <coughs> in, the, in the West as well. He had come back to his home country. Here was one of the, the issues. He was, he was not popular. So he will be the leader of South Vietnam. We support him financially under Eisenhower's administration. And he has his own military protecting South Vietnam, which is going to be called the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. It's often referred to as Arvin. So Arvin is going to be um, in control of protecting South Vietnam. 1956 is on the horizon, and it is very clear that that election is not going to work out in favor of No Din Jim, that he has become so unpopular in South Vietnam. Part of it is due to his very, very authoritarian policies, um, and part of it is the fact that he is Catholic in a Buddhist country, and he implements some anti-Catholic, I mean, uh, anti-Buddhist policies in a Buddhist nation. So this does not work well. Um, so he is very, very unpopular. So rather than have him lose the election and Vietnam unify under communism, they just don't participate in the election. So the North Vietnamese believe that they have won the election. South Vietnam says, you know, we didn't participate and this escalates the conflict. You can imagine that even some people in South Vietnam are saying, what are we doing? This isn't right. So there becomes communist supporters in the South, people who want to unify Vietnam under one um, Ho Chi Minh led government. Those South Vietnamese fighters who favor communism are going to be called the Viet Cong. So you have Arvin, that is the anti-communist force in South Vietnam, and you have the Viet Cong, which are the communist forces in South Vietnam. And again, we're gonna color code this on a map in class. So if you're having trouble keeping straight who's who and on, and on which side, it's okay, we'll sort it out in class. So the Viet Cong are fighting in the South against Arvin. Where are they getting all these guns and weapons from? Well, they're getting them from Ho Chi Minh, who's getting them from the Soviet Union and from China. All right, so, Kennedy comes into power. Initially, he is supportive of GM, but he believes that he's got to have a little bit more guidance, that he's just messed all of this up. And so we've got to provide a little bit more assistance in helping him to lead. So when Kennedy comes in, this is a little bit of a change, right? So if we think about Vietnam, we can certainly see change over time. This is a change from financial support. Kennedy will now send 11,000 military advisors to go and assist Diem and the Arvin forces. These military advisors, they are not leading the effort. They are simply trying to train the Arvin forces to be more effective. Okay, so that's, that's Kennedy's approach. Um, so then Kennedy gets assassinated. Well, it's, it's still not going well. And Diem is not utilizing the support that Kennedy has provided in the way that Kennedy thinks that it should happen. So Kennedy kind of suggests that he would not be upset if the military, the Arvin leadership in South Vietnam launched a coup and overthrew Diem and one of the military leaders became the head of South Vietnam. He said that that would have American backing. Well, they launched that coup attempt, but uh, rather than just send GM into exile, they brutally murder him. So that didn't exactly go as Kennedy had planned, but the outcome was clear, GM was gone. Um, and you've got the Arvin forces that are now trying to, to maintain control here and not allow the Viet Cong to get control and communism to spread. Within a month of the overthrow of Diem and his assassination is when Kennedy gets assassinated. So again, you can understand why the timing of that 
might have been um, scary for people thinking that this is part of this um, Cold War issue that's brewing and escalating in Vietnam. So Lyndon Johnson comes into power and Lyndon Johnson views the Vietnam War um, as one that we need to take more aggressive action, um, that we're spending a lot of money here um, and we need to end this because he looks back at World War II and the appeasement of Hitler and sees that that was a problem. So Lyndon Johnson comes in with a much more aggressive approach than his predecessor Kennedy had, had, had previously had. You know, he's saying that we need to come in, we expect a victory, we're not gonna end up in a stalemate like we did in Korea. So he's very, very clear that that's the approach that he wants to take. Pretty soon after he comes in, there's going to be a situation that takes place over here in the Gulf of Tonkin. So if this is Vietnam, here's roughly that 17th line of latitude. We have American battleships that are patrolling here off the coast of North Vietnam. And there, um, the USS Maddox was one of those battleships. And there are reports that come in that the battleship, the USS Maddox had been fired upon by North Vietnamese forces. Um, that the first attack was basically a gunshot. The second one, it turns out, probably never hit the USS Maddox. Either way, Lyndon Johnson goes to the legislature, reports that American um, um, forces have been fired upon by the North Vietnamese. And he asked for the authority, and look at the wording here, this is gonna ultimately be called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. So this is a quote from the, Gulf, the resolution that he puts before Congress where he's asking for um, authority as president to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. So as commander in chief, he is asking for this authority as president to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. Well, what does that mean? What does all necessary measures, what would that include? Could it include um, putting money into the situation? Could it include soldiers actually on the ground in Vietnam? Could it include um, potentially the use of more powerful weapons? It can include anything that the president believes is necessary to protect the United States from further aggression. This is essentially just the, the legislature that under the constitution has the authority to declare war they're kind of turning that over to the president and giving the president unlimited authority without the oversight of the legislature. Now, think about why they would have done that. At the time, we're at the height of the Cold War. Um, they want to be able to react quickly. So this is called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And when uh, Lyndon Johnson is going to sign that, that gives him almost complete authority. Now, he does not escalate things because 1964 is also an election year. Remember that Kennedy was up for re-election. That's why he was in Dallas in 1963. Lyndon Johnson's there in 1964. You've got the Gulf of Tonkin incident. He gets the Gulf of Tonkin resolution passed, but he's not going to escalate the, the military action until after the election because he's worried about uh, the influence that that could have on the vote. Once he's safely reelected and he is inaugurated in January of 65, by February of 1965, he opens up what's called Operation Rolling Thunder. We call this the Americanization of the war. Prior to this, American forces that were in Vietnam as advisors, this was Vietnam's war that America was assisting in. With Operation Rolling Thunder, the United States takes over the war this becomes the Americanization of the war that the South Vietnamese are assisting American forces in. So Operation Rolling Thunder is this massive bombing campaign of North Vietnam. Uh, you can see here that General Westmoreland is the tactical um, uh, general commander on the ground. And then Robert McNamara is the Secretary of Defense and they are 
both instrumental in, in um, putting all this together. The bombing that is carried out over North Vietnam between 1965 and when the US uh, leaves Vietnam in 1972 is more than double all of the bombing that was used by the allied forces in World War II in the Pacific and in Europe combined. So it was a massive amount of firepower that was just you know constantly, constant bombardment of North Vietnam. So this didn't have as great of effect as, a, as an effect as you would think, because again, this is not a highly industrialized area and the Ho Chi Minh fighters, the Viet Minh are largely bunkered down in caves that are underground. And so these bombing raids don't have a huge effect on changing the outcome of the war. It's just more and more and more uh, resources that are being used. There were also new weapons that were used in, in Vietnam. Uh, one is napalm, which is a, an explosive jelly that when it is dropped from the planes and it explodes, it accelerates into this jelly that just engulfs everything in flames. Incredibly dangerous. Um, you can see villages that are wiped out that were thought to be stronghold for Viet Cong uh, and um, North Vietnamese villages are going to be raided by napalm. And it's um, just, just horrific. And then the other one is Agent Orange because that was one of the other issues. The big advantage that the, um, uh, the forces, the South Vietnamese forces had is the American Air Force that is able to um, fly these raids over Vietnam um, because that was not something that the North Vietnamese fighters had at their disposal. The problem was Viet Vietnam was a very, very densely vegetated country. So from the air, um, the enemy could be hiding and it was very difficult to, to be able to maneuver um, planes and, and be strategic in where you were launching those raids. So Agent Orange was an herbicide that was used to kill off the vegetation in huge swaths of area. Um, the problem was there were American soldiers on the ground when this herbicide is being sprayed from the air and they're exposed to it. And it turns out in the 70s and into the 80s that a lot of soldiers from the Vietnam era um, are going to die of cancer from exposure to a Agent Orange, which turns out is a carcinogen. Uh, and they also, children that are born to Vietnam veterans, there are many birth defects uh, of children born in the 70s from soldiers that came back that had been exposed to Agent Orange. So this turned out to just be a horrible disaster uh, in its use in, in the Vietnam War. All right, Ho Chi Minh. Now, if we think about what odds he has of winning this war, let's lay this out. So you've got Ho Chi Minh, who is a revolutionary fighter in a country that is not industrialized, doesn't have a, a lot of money, doesn't have a lot of resources at their disposal. And they are up against the United States military that had demonstrated in World War II that it was one of the most powerful in the world. And the production of capability, the mobilization for war was like no other place in the world. What chance does Ho Chi Minh have of winning against the United States? Almost none. Yes, he's being equipped and supplied by the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union is not in a direct fight with the United States here. They're still, it's very indirect. So what Ho Chi Minh does is he actually kind of uses the American Revolutionary uh, War strategy against the United States. You know, didn't George Washington know he was up against a superior military? And so he had to be unconventional in the way that he fought. He couldn't be you know, in a wide open field and fight it out one line against the other. And he had to be unpredictable. And he also had to not engage the enemy in a battle that he knew he couldn't win. He had to just simply outlast the British. Ho Chi Minh does the same thing. Ho Chi Minh knows that this is incredibly expensive. And he believes that over time, if they can stretch this war out long enough, that the American commitment to the fight will be wear, worn down by opposition in the American uh, public. And so he uses um, 
um, unconventional warfare. Like I said, he's going to have booby traps out in the jungle. He's going to set up um, in the rice paddy. So certain times of the year, the rice fields, they flood. Um, and certain times of the year, they, they dry up. So in these rice paddies, before they would flood, they would put these stakes, they were called punji stakes, and they would take bamboo and they were pointed just, um, or, or carved to where they were incredibly sharp. And then they would put um, uh, feces on the end of these punji stakes. And when American soldiers were slogging through, um, the spike would go through their boot, okay? Same thing here in these booby traps, they would have these grass mats that would be over uh, the ground you wouldn't know it. There's been a hole that was dug. You step in it, you fall in. They're punji stakes down in the bottom. So a lot of, of just very um, nerve wracking and just awful um, wounds came about as a result of, of a lot of this. Um, so this wears down um, the American will to fight. So that's kind of what Ho Chi Minh's strategy was. And in many ways it worked. There becomes a growing divide in the United States over involvement in Vietnam. You've got the draft that's in place. You have uh, young people who are going to war for a war that they don't necessarily know that they want to fight in. Um, you have others who are saying that absolutely containment of communism is the priority in the world at this time. So it, it, it's really just kind of where Where's your main focus? Is your main focus in the Cold War? Is your main focus the war on poverty? Is your main focus on um, rights, equality for a variety of, of groups of people? So on college campuses is where we see this turmoil just really beginning to divide the nation. And um, this group, the Young Americans for Freedom or YAF as it's most commonly called, are the conservative groups and their belief is that the containment of communism is absolutely essential for the United States survival and the economic survival and growth of the United States. So they wrote a document called the Sharon Statement where they lay out um, why they believe that a conservative approach and a victory in Vietnam is absolutely essential and um, we're, you're gonna read a portion of that in class as well. So there's two documents that student groups are going to publish. The Young Americans for Freedom or YAF will produce the Sharon Statement and then the, um, the students that are for a more liberal approach or um, what we call the new left will be the Students for a Democratic Society or SDS. And their statement of, of beliefs and what they want to see happen will be the P Port Huron statement. So you're going to be reading both of those. So you've got college campuses that are now divided among the students themselves. This also plays out in communities where communities become divided over liberal versus com, uh, conservative approaches. Um, Tom Hayden is one of the leaders of SDS. And look what he has to say. We are People of this generation, bred in at least modest comfort, housed now in universities, looking uncomfortably to the world that we inherit. And uh, so he is looking at this idea of uh, fighting in these wars as something that they don't want to happen. So this is playing out on college campuses, but you've also got young people who are just um, frustrated with uh, the policies and, you know, the 1950s and the conformity and, and all of this just accepting the way things are. And so it starts this larger movement that is opposed to government control, opposed to the war, opposed to um, just the, the very consumer driven economy and um, conformity and uh, all of that from the 1950s. And that's gonna become known as the counterculture. Um, so you've got, and sometimes they're referred to as the hippies. And I want us to look at some of the um, activities here. Uh, they're gonna be engaged in protest uh, for various causes. So they're, they're a little more tied to actual causes in the earlier parts of the 1960s. But by the time we get to the late 1960s and the early 1970s, the counterculture, it's more, self-destruction. There's going to be so much um, abuse of um, drugs and um, 
just just complete disregard for a purpose in what they're doing. So it, it kind of changes uh, over time. You've probably heard of Woodstock, which was this three-day music event that took place in upstate New York, in uh, Woodstock, New York, uh, or Bethel, New York. And it was actually on, and it was on farmland. And just hundreds of thousands of people just took over this whole area. Um, and you just had an all-star cast. Look at who played here. You've got Joan Baez, Arlo Guthrie, um, um, Credence Clearwater, Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, Santana, The Who, Country Joe and the Fish. He was incredibly popular. Jimi Hendrix, um, and then Joe Cocker, Crosby, Stills and Nash. This is like an all-star cast uh, of, of famous musicians in the 1960s. And a lot of their music started to um, at the time, tell the story of the protest and the frustration that the counterculture was really upset about. And so the music becomes a vehicle of getting their, their message and their point across. So I want to show you this clip about um, the counterculture and the event at Woodstock um, so that you kind of understand what went on here and why. <laughs> We started to hear rumors that this thing was more or less out of hand because no one knew the amount of tickets that were sold. We were on the state highway. The cars were stopping, and we realized that this was parking for the concert. I had never seen that many people in my life in one place at one time. And it's backed up from White Lake right back through on the quick Everything that could possibly go wrong was happening. There was a sanitation crisis and there was a medical crisis. The governor was considering sending in the National Guard. They said it was a danger to the community, it was a danger to public health, it was a danger to any damn thing they could think of. I just kept thinking, which direction is this thing going to go? Like 1969, it really did feel like we were finally winning some kind of cultural war against the establishment. Young people were rejecting the status quo. The one thing that affected everybody was the war in Vietnam. I knew a lot of people who just felt, we have to do things differently. We were looking for answers. We were looking for other people that felt the same way as we did. The outside world thought it was a disaster area. Well, that's not what we thought. It was the freedom of being able to be who you were, not feeling that somebody was going to judge you. All right, so that um, there's a, a whole um, video, a documentary on it. It's on American Experience. If you're interested, it's a it's a good documentary, but it's on Woodstock. You can see that online. So the protest music. Look at some of these lyrics. This is Bob Dylan, um, and times they are a changing. You know, he talks about what's going on in Vietnam. He talks about race relations, Country Joe and the Fish. Same thing. Um, Eve of Destruction is one of those that is probably one of the more famous of the 1960s protest songs. It's by Barry McGuire. Look what he's saying. The Eastern world, it is exploding. Violence, flaring bullets, loading. You're old enough to kill, but not for voting. Because at that time, the voting age was 21. After Vietnam is when they're going to lower it to 18. But if you can be drafted at 18, you should be able to vote who is sending you into that war. Don't believe in war, what's that gun you're toting? But even the Jordan River has bodies floating. But you tell me over and over, over again, my friend, and you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction. So they're talking about, you know, where's this going to escalate to? So 60s protest music, it tells a story. It tells the, the issues of the time that the young people are paying attention to. All right, so as we look at um, how this is all gonna play out in Vietnam, by 1967, Operation Rolling Thunder has been going on for two years and we are stuck. It is incredibly expensive. 
We're not making any sort of, of gains in Vietnam because the, the Viet Cong in South Vietnam are gaining more of a hold. The Viet Minh in the North, they're just, you know, holed up in those caves and we're just not really gaining much of anything. And uh, there's more and more growing opposition in the United States. But remember that Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Can the Congress do anything about it? No, because they've turned over power to the president. So look at the, um, the cartoon here. So you've got Lyndon Johnson and he is, um, he's got the Vietnam War over here who is very well, uh, you know, put together. And then you've got US urban needs that is just there in rags. And so look what he has to say. There's money enough to support both of you. Now, doesn't that make you feel better? But if you think about point of view from this cartoon, wouldn't this person be critical of what Lyndon Johnson is, is spending on the war? Because he's saying there's enough money to go for the war on poverty, but that's not what people are believing, or at least this cartoonist is not believing that. Okay, the government just is, is continuing to say by the time we get into 1968, they're saying, you know, victory's right around the corner. They're trying to convince the American people that um, the war is in, the end is in sight and it's gonna be a victory for the United States. 1968 is a year like no other. There is so much that happens in this one year related to so many different issues. And it starts here in, in January of 1968. Cause again, uh, remember that the government's telling the, the public the end is in sight. But this is also a war, it's sometimes referred to as a living room war because you've actually got reporters that are traveling around with the soldiers. So when the government is telling the American people, you know, we've got, we've got the uh, Viet Minh on the ropes, the Viet Cong, we we're rooting them out of South Vietnam, all is going to be won here very, very quickly. But the reporters who are on the ground traveling with the soldiers, what they're showing on the news every night is very different. So there's a disconnect between the reporting and what the government is saying. And so that's gonna be, a, it's called the credibility gap, right? There's um, a, a lack of credibility as to what the government is saying. So when the government is, is trying to convince people at the end of 1967 that um, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese are about to give up, all of a sudden in January, the Tet Offensive happens and Tet is one of the, the holidays. It's like the, the New Year holiday. Um, and nobody thought that there would be fighting on the Tet holiday, kind of along the lines of the strategy that George Washington used at that Christmas night attack. But what happens in the Tet Offensive is all of these places in South Vietnam are attacked at the same time. Um, so it is a, a very coordinated attack in the South. It's the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong working together. Eventually, the United States is able to officially win the Tet Offensive, right? You don't have South Vietnam falling to the North Vietnamese with this Tet Offensive. But what it does do is it proves to the American people that what they're being told by the government, that victory is around the corner, that the North Vietnamese forces in Ho Chi Minh, that they're falling apart, about ready to give up. This clearly shows that they're nowhere close to giving up. And that adds to more protest and fuel in the United States. 1968 is an election year and Lyndon Johnson is eligible to run again because you'll remember that he had only served one year of John Kennedy's term and he's had one term of his own and the Constitution says that if you serve less than um, half of um, a previous president's term, when you take over as vice president, it doesn't count as one of your two. So Lyndon Johnson is eligible to run for a second term and he stuns the American people. He comes on television in March, right? So the Tet Offensive has just been a nightmare. And um, there's so much criticism that we're spending so much money and so many American lives and, uh, are lost. Uh, in the, in the uh, fighting in Vietnam that's been going on uh, for so long, right? The, um, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was passed and all that funding in the, the Operation Rolling Thunder starts in 65. 
So we've had three years of just massive, massive fighting and losses. He goes on television and says, we're gonna scale it back. We're gonna begin to withdraw from Vietnam and we're going to seek a negotiated settlement. What does a negotiated settlement mean? Isn't that exactly what we saw with France and the Geneva Accords where they stop fighting and they're going to negotiate an end to this? Well, if they're gonna um, have a negotiated settlement in Vietnam, won't that mean that Ho Chi Minh is going to be allowed to maintain the government there and it would be unified under communism? Um, and he stuns everybody, even his own advisors, at the end of that speech when he says that we're gonna scale back the bombing, we're gonna have a negotiated settlement to end the conflict. And he says, and I'm not gonna run for reelection. And everyone's like, what? They're stunned that he's not going to run for president in 1968. So in the midst of all this turmoil with Vietnam, we now have an uncertain outcome of the election. It is March of an election year. When did we know, our, all right, so the election in 1920, I mean, uh, 2020, the one that we just had, we already knew like who was running long before. This is an incumbent president who's saying, I'm not running. And the Democrats don't have a clue who their candidate is going to be. And we're within months of the election taking place. It, it was a, a disaster, okay? The following month, April of 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. Um, that war on poverty, there wasn't a whole lot that was um, a progress that had been made uh, in the urban areas. And Martin Luther King Jr. has, um, there was that shift that we talked about in the, in the movement, the civil rights movement. And Martin Luther King was going to Memphis to, to help the, the garbage collectors there protest for fair wages and that kind of thing. And he'd given a speech um, and the night before he was staying at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. It was one of those where the, the doors open up to the outside. So they're on the balcony there. And uh, this man, uh, James Earl Ray steps out and he shoots and kills Martin Luther King Jr. right there on uh, the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. So here, this civil rights icon, this, this person who supported nonviolent protests, peaceful protests, is now assassinated. So that is, is definitely going to cause uh, turmoil. By then, the Democrats had been trying to put together who their nominee would be because you've got the primaries. Remember, the primary election process is where you vote within the party as to who your nominee will be in the general election in November. And um, in April, right, when this happens, had been the California primary. And, um, um, or it was starting the primary season, not the California primary, but it was the starting the primary season. And Robert Kennedy is now, it's suggested that he might be a good candidate for the Democrats. Well, he comes out before the crowd that he's speaking to and he, and he announces that Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated and people are stunned. Um, and they're, they're looking to, um, you know, there's, there's violence in cities across the United States as um, the assassination occurs. Robert Kennedy really emerges as the front runner for the Democratic nomination. And then he is going to be um, assassinated in May of 1969. So a month later after uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Robert Kennedy won the California primary, and that was probably going to seal the deal that he would be the Democratic nominee. And he was celebrating the victory at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. And so he's talking to a, a crowd of supporters and, and people who had worked on the campaign. And he's got to go to a couple of other campaign stops um, celebrating the, the victory that night. So to get him out, without delay, um, you know, so he doesn't get stopped by the crowd, you know, here he is speaking and on the stage and what they're gonna do is they're going to get him through the, the back um, hallways where the kitchen staff and the uh, wait staff in these ballrooms in a hotel where they work. So he's going to go through these doors and go through the kitchen out the, of the hotel to get in the car to go to the next uh, campaign stop. When he's in the kitchen, this guy, Sirhan Sirhan, who is a Palestinian 
very upset with the way that the Kennedy brothers had approached um, the situation in the Middle East, steps out and assassinates Robert Kennedy right there in uh, the hotel. Um, notice this guy back here. He's an NFL football player. That's Rosie Greer. Um, he and some others tackled Sirhan Sirhan and he was apprehended right there. Uh, and he stayed in, in prison uh, in California. I don't know that he's still alive, um, but he, he was still in prison in California up until at least a few years ago. He may have passed away by this point, but I'm not sure. So then that means that the Democratic convention that's gonna be hosted within a couple of months of Robert Kennedy being killed is just a free for all. They have no idea who the nominee is going to be. Um, Robert Kennedy, again, they thought that he was going to be the front runner. Now it comes down to Eugene McCarthy. This is not Joe McCarthy. This is totally different. This is not connected to Joseph McCarthy and McCarthyism. Um, but Eugene McCarthy and Hubert Humphrey um, are now left to be the nominees. And the convention's going to happen in Chicago. You have a lot of um, anti-war protesters with the conservatives that are um, um, at odds with one another. And here's the mayor of Chicago saying that we're not going to have all of this protesting in his city. He calls in the police and you've got riots right outside of the convention center. So Hubert Humphrey was Lyndon Johnson's vice president. Eugene McCarthy is his opponent. So when it, it, it plays out, Hubert Humphrey becomes the, uh, the nominee, okay? The uh, South is going to go with George Wallace. So he is from Alabama. He is a very, very strong segregationist. He had blocked the University of Alabama from integration uh, and he is going to run as an independent, sort of like we saw in 1948 with the Dixiecrats. Now you've got the American Independent Party with George Wallace running in the South. Okay. Richard Nixon is going to be the Republican nominee. And Richard Nixon's going to be quite um, strategic in the way that he runs this election. He knows that the Democratic Party is in complete chaos. Um, with everything that has happened throughout 1968. And he is also going to play to um, what he calls the silent majority. He doesn't believe that the majority of Americans are out picketing and protesting uh, and engaging in violence. He thinks that most Americans are actually sitting at home, watching it on TV, shaking their heads about what has happened to their country. He also believes that many Americans are upset with the idea of a negotiated settlement in Vietnam. And Hubert Humphrey, um, you know, is the, the Democratic nominee. Nixon is going to say, if you elect me, we will have peace in Vietnam, but we will have it honorably because this negotiated settlement, that would not be a victory for the United States. And he says that that's gonna weaken the United States in this Cold War rivalry with the Soviet Union. So he says, elect me, peace with honor in Vietnam. Um, he is going to appeal to what he calls the silent majority. And he also has his Southern strategy. He also believes that many Southerners are frustrated with um, the, the situation and don't really want to vote Democratic. They also realize that George Wallace is very racist so he's kind of trying to appeal to this, this moderate, this conservative side to the Democratic Party. And he calls it his Southern strategy. You know, he says that he's not going to block civil rights legislation, but he lets it be known that he's not going to be aggressive in its enforcement either. So in the end, he wins, okay? So Richard Nixon comes in as president. So now this is our fifth president dealing with the, um, um, Vietnam situation. There's also going to be a shift in the women's movement. So by now, the late 1960s and early 1970s, we're going to have what's called the women's lib movement. So the, um, the feminist movement with um, Betty Friedan and the feminine mystique, it's going to kind of merge into this new effort. Uh, and Gloria Steinem is going to be right there alongside Betty Friedan working for 
women's liberation. They want equality in all things. They're protesting here at the Miss America pageant, um, saying that that's the exploitation of women. And ultimately what they do achieve. So the women's liberation movement, this is where you see women feminists who are working for equality. Um, you've got, and notice Gloria Steinem's magazine, it's called Ms. Magazine, MS period. And that was, you know, one of the, the areas of the women's movement at that time was they looked at a woman's marital status was her identity. Um, you know, your many women, their, their outlook was just to, to get married. Um, and that was beginning to change, that more women were beginning to have their own careers, beginning to look at opportunities that were available to them. So Ms. Magazine, MS period, that becomes kind of the, a new title that women began to acquire. You know, if you're M-I-S-S, -S, you know, and then your name, if you're female, that typically depicts you as a, as a girl, right? Uh, a child who is a female. An M-R-S period, Mrs., designates you as a married woman. So your identity is determined based on your marital status, where a male, it doesn't change. You're, you're Mr. So-and-so, regardless of whether or not you're married. And so these women uh, in the women's lib movement were saying, why is that? Why should we um, have all of our identity tied to um, our marital status. So MS period is referencing an adult woman. Um, it, you could be an MS period, whether you're married or not. So that's kind of why this magazine, it's a, a feminist magazine that Gloria Steinem um, is going to, to be the founder of. Uh, and there she is, it's still published 30 years later. And I believe it's actually still published as well. One of the achievements that the women's lib movement is going to, to have is Title IX. And this is going to be in addition to the uh, Civil Rights Act that is going to guarantee equal funding um, for women um, that you can't have public facilities or you can't have organizations, public, uh, um, uh, federal organi federally funded organizations or federal money going into institutions that discriminate against women. So one of the, the big areas that Title IX got into was women in sports. You know, if you think about the college campuses, you had all of these male sports, but there were no sports for women. So Title IX guarantees that access. So this was a victory for the women's lib movement. Another area where we really start to see a, a new um, effort for equality is in gay rights. And that starts with the Stonewall riots really is when this all begins. Um, there had long been raids, police raids of um, bars and nightclubs that were uh, gay bars and nightclubs. And the Stonewall Hotel or the Stonewall uh, Inn was a gay bar in New York City in Greenwich Village. And one night there was a police raid that was there and it turned violent. And um, there were people who uh, were injured and the um, uh, lots of arrests, notice that they estimated that 200 people um, were part of the, the group that was thrown out of the bar, but then the crowd escalates uh, and it becomes more violent. But what this does is it draws attention to discrimination against homosexuals. And it, it draws more of an effort to this. So this starts the, the gay liberation movement of the 1970s and then into the 1980s. We'll get into Harvey Milk and some of the other efforts uh, of gay rights in the next unit. But this is where it starts is in the Stonewall riots still uh, in this same time period. All right, so we're gonna finish up here with the silent majority now that Richard Nixon has been elected. You'll remember that he had promised peace with honor, and he had also promised the Vietnamization of the war. So he wants to go back to the Vietnamese taking the, uh, the main role in the fighting in Vietnam, and the United States would de-escalate, but it would be where they're going to be able to win. So here's that peace with honor. Vietnamization of the war is what he had promised. 
Um, instead, we see the, the movement of US military attacks now into Cambodia uh, and bombing of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So we, uh, in class, are doing this, uh, this map. And you know that the Ho Chi Minh Trail, where all the fighting between the United States and the South Vietnamese forces and the North Vietnamese forces um, was just so heavily fought. The Viet Cong needed to be supplied by Ho Chi Minh. There was no way he was gonna get that across the 17th line of latitude. So they went through the remote areas to the countries to the west of Vietnam through what was known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So it was basically a network of moving military equipment to the South Vietnamese fighters. Um, so we started bombing raids into Cambodia and Laos. We sent ground forces into Cambodia to attack the North Vietnamese strongholds there. There was their, their own communist uh, forces that began to form in uh, Cambodia known as the Khmer Rouge. They're gonna be very important after um, the Vietnam War. One of the communist leaders of the Khmer Rouge comes to power and he's just a brutal dictator uh, later on when you get into Pol Pot and some of the other atrocities that he carried out. So when people started, when this started happening in the early 1970s, people were like, what are you talking about? Peace with honor, Vietnamization. This looks like an escalation of the war because now the United States is not just fighting in Vietnam. Now we're fighting in Cambodia and in Laos. So this is really, really a problem. And more protests on college campuses get even more aggressive, um, protesting the war, right? So we've got this, um, this effort in, in uh, uh, young people to protest the war saying that this is, you know, why are we doing this? So at Kent State University in Ohio, there was a standoff between the student protesters and the military that was there to try to keep order and shots were fired. And when it was all said and done, you had, I think um, 11 or 12 students that were hit with gunfire, uh, didn't die and four of them did die. Um, one of those famous protest songs that we talked about, Crosby, Stills and Nash, their song Ohio is about the Kent State massacre as it was called. So then after this happens at Kent State, other college campuses, we start to see standoff after standoff between the various groups that are protesting the war. So this was not going the way that Nixon would have wanted. Um, there's also um, when Nixon uh, is elected in, in 68 and um, there, and he takes office in, in January of 69, there comes to light later in 1969, an incident that had occurred in 68, but nobody knew about it until afterwards. And that was the My Lai massacre. And this was a, a um, horrible situation that occurred in South Vietnam in the village of My Lai. And it was thought to be a Viet Cong stronghold that the Viet Cong were uh, embedded among the villagers there and um, that they were uh, launching you know, attacks against American forces. And the mission that Lieutenant William Cauley's unit was sent on was to um, get rid of the Viet Cong in the My Lai village. Well, when they got there, um, it turned incredibly, incredibly violent. You had um, the entire village was wiped out. They set fire, this man here is setting fire to the, to the huts that the people were living in. And then you can see the assassination of these villagers, these women and children. Um, when this came to light, it, it was shown that the brutality that was used was far beyond what would have been acceptable in this uh, a typical military mission. And there were hearings that took place, uh, court martial of Lieutenant William Colley, court martial is a, a military hearing. And that took place in 1971 and he was convicted. But again, it just looks like that this situation in Vietnam, it's just more and more and more bad news. You also have in 1971, a series of publications in the New York Times that become known as the Pentagon Papers. And it, these articles end up being put together um, in a, um, it's a, basically a long overview of the history of the involvement of the United States in Vietnam. Because remember, Nixon has promised peace with honor. 
1971 and the war's not over yet. If anything, it's escalated. Um, and so they trace in the New York Times the entire history. They go all the way back to Truman and the financial involvement, but they also begin to uncover more sources that the way that this was being portrayed to the American public is not always the way that it was happening in Vietnam. For example, the My Lai Massacre, the way that that went, uh, uh, took place was not exactly the way that it was being um, described to the American public by the government. So this also really makes the, this look like a, a very bad um, situation. So when we look at that and we look at the, the problems across the country that it's just boiling over, um, 1972 is an election year. And I want you to look at what happens. Look at this, Richard Nixon wins in an absolute landslide over George McGovern. How in the world can Richard Nixon win this easily when you've got the bad publicity of Me Lai, the expansion of the war into Cambodia, the turmoil on the college campuses, you've got all of this happening. How does he win this easily? So I think that's something uh, to really pay attention to. So when we look at his efforts, all right, it's his approach to foreign policy and the Cold War, right? The world was an incredibly dangerous place in the Cold War. We had seen the, the near miss with the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and how that could have easily gone the path to World War III. We've got this tension certainly in Southeast Asia but when Nixon came to power, his um, Secretary of State was Henry Kissinger, and they had a new approach to foreign policy. So, you know, again, we're talking about continuities and changes over time. This is absolutely another change in foreign policy, and it's going to be called detente, um, which is more or less like scaling things back where it's not on the brink of war. And they also look at it as what's known as real politic. And they begin to assess the situation. And they look at our economic friends and our economic enemies. And, and then our political friends and our political enemies. And Nixon and Kissinger say that we may have this backwards. You know, if we are looking at China as an enemy politically, but China has this very large population, and it's not as industrialized at this point as the United States. And the same thing in the Soviet Union, we could be trade partners with, um, you know, we could be trading and making money with opening up these places, even though we I, ideologically don't agree with them and we still don't agree with communism and we still don't want communism to come into the United States, we could be opening this up and it would benefit us in other ways. If we look at our political friends, um, our allies, aren't we economic competitors with them? So what they're saying is that we can approach this in a different way and look at our actual goals of what we wanna achieve, okay? So what he does, Nixon actually goes to China. Remember how we said when the Chinese Civil War took place that the United States never actually recognized China as a, a true and legitimate nation under Mao? Nixon agrees, Mao is the leader, China is communist, and he goes to China and he visits. Well, when he goes and he visits China, the Soviet Union now has another leader. Remember Nikita Khrushchev kind of lost favor there after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the new leader that comes into power uh, eventually in the Soviet Union is, is uh, Leonid Brezhnev. Here he is. And when Nixon goes to China, Brezhnev is like, oh my gosh, what is he up to? Here's some images. Uh, and then what also happens in China is we call it ping pong diplomacy. There's going to be the U.S. table tennis team will go and participate in a tournament in China. So this, and you remember that scene from Forrest Gump, I'm sure, that really happened. So it's opening up 
and it kind of scales back the tension there. So look at what Brezhnev might be thinking. What if Nixon is in China and he's working behind the scenes to negotiate with Mao to come into the war in Vietnam on the side of the United States in North Vietnam? Or think about geography. What if the United States is trying to get China as an ally and they go up against the Soviet Union? So Brezhnev is really concerned about some behind the scenes negotiation that really wasn't happening, but could have been. And so, uh, and this is all 1971. So, and then here's Nixon in China. I love this picture. He, he's not so sure what he's doing there, but again, it looks fairly peaceful. He travels around, you know, these iconic places in China uh, and it was a successful visit. So Brezhnev, contacts Nixon and says, you need to come visit Moscow. So he goes to Moscow and they begin to negotiate and they uh, are going to institute the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty or SALT-1. So it does not stop nuclear weapons development, but it scales back um, production. It scales back stockpiles of weapons. Now you're not gonna give up all of your nuclear weapons but you're scaling it back. And so if you're in the midst of the Cold War where people were terrified of World War III and a nuclear attack and mutually assured destruction, but here you've got this American president that is opening up diplomacy and this idea of detente with the Soviet Union, the world has now been made a safer place. So when you put that together, that's why Nixon gets reelected so overwhelmingly. All right, um, and he is again promising this end to the war. So once he's reelected in um, 72, then we're going to see the Paris Peace Accords that are going to be signed in January of 73. So look what these will say. So this is going to end the Vietnam War. So this is under Nixon's watch, the Paris Peace Accords. So the Geneva Accords were the agreements, the negotiated settlement between France and uh, Ho Chi Minh. The Paris Peace Accords will be the negotiated settlement between United States, South Vietnam, North Vietnam, and the Viet Cong. It is a ceasefire and the United States soldiers will leave. So isn't this kind of what uh, Lyndon Johnson was saying was going to happen? Um, it, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, prisoners are going to be exchanged and they are going to say that temporarily, okay, they're kind of going down this road again, that temporarily you're going to have split governments that the North Vietnamese soldiers um, would not interfere with the non-communist government that's staying in power at least temporarily in South Vietnam. Now, it was pretty obvious that that was on shaky ground, but this was the agreement. United States soldiers are going to leave um, uh, South Vietnam. They leave the war. So this really is not a victory for the United States. Um, not technically a loss either, it's a negotiated settlement, but we did not achieve our goals of keeping Vietnam as a non-communist nation. Look what happens by 1975. So by April of 1975, you've got um, the communist forces take control of Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam, and they take control of Saigon. They rename it Ho Chi Minh City. And um, this is a picture from the US Embassy in Saigon. And as soon as that uh, takeover took place, I mean, it was within a matter of days, everything just erupted. And this is um, the evacuation of American families and um, uh, workers from the embassy to get them out to safety. Uh, and it was just a, a terrible mess. And so it all fell to communism. Um, by this point, um, when, when Saigon falls, this is really after um, Gerald Ford had come in, after Nixon resigned because of Watergate, but the US technically was not still involved here because the, um, the settlement Paris Peace Accords had been signed in 73. All right, also in 73, there is a measure in Congress because Congress is, this had drug on um, for so many years after uh, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution 
Um, Congress wanted to bring soldiers back. They wanted to scale it back, but they didn't have the authority to because of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. They had given away that power to the president. This is where they're gonna take it back. So the War Powers Act is going to undo the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. So here in 1973, and this law is still in effect, it restricts the president's power to send soldiers into a combat situation without the authorization of Congress. Now, there may be an emergency situation that the president doesn't have time for Congress to vote and the president has the authority to, to react as he sees necessary or she sees necessary in, a com, in an uh, emergency situation. <coughs> but the War Powers Act says that within <coughs> a certain amount of time, Congress has to be notified and Congress has to agree to the commitment of those soldiers. Nixon did not want this law to be passed because again, it's gonna restrict his own power. So he vetoed the War Powers Act um, and then Congress comes back in and overrides the veto. So I think that is uh, very significant legislation that's passed. So you wanna to tie together the War Powers Act and the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution because the War Powers Act will undo the shift in power from the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. All right, and then uh, we've got the, uh, the Warren Court. Again, this idea of the liberal courts that are still um, in control and we see some of the, the outcomes here. So the Earl Warren is still on the bench in the 1960s. He was the one who had um, written the opinion in the Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954. Uh, we've also got this idea of um, uh, reforms that are going to be very important. So the Baker versus Carr, you're gonna get into that next year when you take government, but it's basically about the, the way that voting in state elections was being conducted. That makes that illegal for states to try to manipulate the vote because it, again, it was based on, on race. Um, you've also got Miranda, the Miranda warning, okay? If you get arrested, so Gideon versus Wainwright, Escobedo, and the Miranda case, all three of these, these are the three that I want you to pay attention to from this list, Gideon, Escobedo, and Miranda. These three cases are going to protect the rights of people accused of crimes. So you've probably seen before that when a person gets arrested, the police officer reads them their Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney, you know, all of these um, provisions. And it was basically at the time saying that people were being arrested and they were being taken advantage of by the police officers and by the government because they didn't know what their rights were. So this guarantees rights of individuals being protected like with a speedy trial uh, and the Miranda rights. All right, so there we have the end of time period eight. And we only have one left and it is very, very short. So we will pick up there next time with time period nine. So until then, keep reading and go make history.